This is a really good question. What is in fact a digital twin? Well, we recently did a webinar with Paul Miller as a guest from Forrester, and he answered this question brilliantly. So I just thought I would share that with you here. If you want to see the full webinar, the link is in the description below. You're going to hear in great detail in the customer session how two you know, great organizations are doing this stuff for real and the real problems and the real challenges and the real opportunities they're seeing as a result. Before we get to that practical, pragmatic piece of the conversation, I'm going to take the conversation up a level and talk a little bit more theoretically about what a digital twin is and what a digital twin is not, and then look at some of the ways in which it's being used as well. Can I have the next slide, please? So yes, as I said, what is a digital twin? What is it not? And then also looking briefly at some broad use cases around digital twin, which may lead us into the conversation with those customer representatives quite nicely. So this is Forrester's definition of a digital twin. I don't know about the rest of you, but I see a lot of material, a lot of marketing, um, a lot of hype, a lot of enthusiasm around what digital twin is. And it all gets frankly quite confusing pretty quickly. Um, is it just that pretty 3D visualization spinning in front of you? Is it something else entirely? Um, and, and with the hype and the, the noise, it can sometimes be hard to tell. So we've tried to clarify that a bit. Um, and particularly from Forrester's perspective, as we look at a digital twin, this definition really does capture what we think one is. A digital representation of a physical thing's data, state, relationships and behavior. So that digital representation of a physical thing, that's the important piece here. And as we look across the space, um, having clarified what a digital twin is, and we'll get deeper on that in just a moment, but with that defini definition of a digital twin, we see clear enthusiasm to do something with it, clear opportunity to, to invest, to spend money to build these things, and then to start reaping the rewards as a result. And the graphic you're seeing on the slide here is from one of Forrester's assessments of a market space. This is what we call a tech tide. And in, in this particular case, I was looking at 20 technologies in the smart manufacturing space, which is where I spend a lot of my time. And up there in the top left-hand corner in that invest category, digital twin sitting alongside things like industrial IoT and location-based tracking and machine learning and AI, but digital twin, the subject of today's conversation, sitting right up there. So high business value, and we're hearing this consistently, and I'm sure we'll hear it um, from the customers today as well, but relatively immature. The solutions that are out there in the market aren't fully blown necessarily. They're, they're addressing segments of the problem and delivering pieces of the value. They're getting better every day. They're getting richer and more interconnected every day, but still relatively immature. So huge opportunity there for vendors like Matterport to jump in and, and, and offer value. And I said at the beginning, there's a lot of noise around Digital Twin. Um, hopefully, we're not adding to that noise today. Hopefully, we're bringing clarity to that, to that conversation today. And you can be the judge of that in the audience. Let us know how we did. But as we look at this from Forrester, we look at all the different Digital Twin solutions out there in manufacturing, in building management, in healthcare, in retail, in aerospace, and in all these other um, market segments, we find six common key characteristics wherever we look for a real digital twin. And those six characteristics you can see here on the slide. And I'm going to talk about each of them briefly in turn. And shouldn't be any surprise here, a digital twin has to be a twin. There has to be another one. And in this case, of course, there has to be a physical one. So there are always two, one physical, one digital. And some of the, the richer sort of visualizations and simulations we see may have no connection to a real thing at all. And our argument is that in, in a lot of those cases, it might not, might not actually be a digital twin. It might be a beautiful simulation. It might be a very valuable simulation that delivers real business value. 
but it's not a digital twin. So to be a digital twin, first thing, you must be a digital representation of something that exists. The next piece jumping around the diagram is bidirectional data. And here, if you have a physical thing and a digital thing, they must talk to one another. They must communicate about what's actually going on. So the, the, the real world thing that may use IoT sensors to report what it's observing. What temperature is it? How humid is it? How light is it? How much vibration is there? How fast am I moving? All these different measurements of the physical world being communicated back to the digital representation. And then the digital communicating back in the other direction. And so maybe the digital world has, has simulated the angle of the sun and the temperature in a building and has decided that actually the sun is about to shine right in your face in that window. Let's close the blinds. And so the digital sends the instruction to the physical that says, close the blinds now. And then that happens. Timely updates. In a lot of conversations around digital twin as well, one of the things we see come up a lot is this idea that it must be real time. There are telcos all over the world using digital twin as a driver for their 5G investment. You need 5G if you want a digital twin, they say. Um, not necessarily true, actually. And so in our definition, we talk about the importance of timely updates. And this recognizes that for some use cases, you absolutely need real-time connectivity and real-time communication between the physical and the digital. Imagine an autonomous car, for example, driving down the highway. Um, it's on the Autobahn in Germany. It's doing 150 miles an hour. It's going quite fast. It needs real-time communication from the digital simulation to tell it that actually there's a truck in front of it and now's the time to hit the brakes. You can't wait for a a, a slower update it needs to be real time. In other use cases, and the one that's mentioned here on the slide is in the airline business, you just need a timely update. If you are building a digital twin of how a jet airliner consumes fuel as it flies from London to New York, you need a really good model of how that fuel will be consumed. Absolutely. But you use that model to decide how much fuel to put onto the plane. The plane then flies, from London to New York. You do not need to be updating the digital twin every millisecond as to how much fuel is being burned. But when the plane lands, you need to look and see how much fuel was left. And you compare that to the model. Was there more left than you expected? And therefore, actually, can you maybe carry less next time? Or was there less than you expected? And therefore, maybe you need to put a little bit more on next time to give you some padding. But either way, you're feeding that delta back into the model and refining it to understand better how fuel is actually burned on a jet airliner in flight. But you don't need real-time connectivity to deliver that value. If you don't have real-time connectivity, and I've just said you often don't need it, if you don't have it, you need an ability to maintain state. So the digital twin needs to have an understanding of what the physical twin was doing last time it checked in. And it also needs to be able to offer an observer some view of what it thinks the physical thing might be doing right now. So if we go with that jet airliner again, the digital twin was updated just before takeoff with how much fuel there was. Halfway through the flight, you should be able to look at the digital twin and say, I reckon we've consumed about a third of the fuel. That ability to see that is important. It's also important, of course, for the digital twin to be able to tell you that this is an assumption. This is a model. This is a prediction. This is not actually real. And to tell you, you know, I haven't actually talked to my physical twin for the past four hours. So this assumption could be four hours out of date. That ability is important too. The fifth of our six key criteria is this ability to model and analyze. You're gathering all of this data from the real world. It's one thing to report it back and to say, the temperature in this room is 24 degrees Celsius right now. That's useful, that's nice. Or you've consumed a thousand liters of fuel on your jet airliner, useful and nice as well. Much more useful and a much bigger piece of the digital twin story 
to be able to start predicting what will happen next. So it's 24 degrees in this room right now. The air conditioning is not on. The sun is shining in that window in my face. It's going to get warmer and I can predict how it will get warmer based upon where the building is and how thick the glass is and whether it's um, treated for, for solar radiation and all the rest of it. I might start making predictions about when to turn the air conditioning on to cool that room down as it warms up. But using the data to make decisions and to, make, and to take actions in the future, a critically important piece of what we're seeing digital twins be used for. And then the final piece of the six is this ability to report, this ability for the digital twin to tell people what it sees. And this is where the visualization comes in. Things like beautiful Matterport um, point clouds or uh, BIM models or photorealistic visualizations, all of these are some of the reporting that can come out of a digital twin. Just as valuable though, might be a text message to a field service engineer saying, service the HVAC on the 23rd floor, it's about to break or it's broken. That's just as useful a reporting output from the digital twin or a graph on um, the chief executive's desk that shows him how much um, money he's spent on air conditioning in the building this week. I, just as useful an output. So visualization is one piece of the story, but not all of it. And without all six of these working together, is it a digital twin? So what is a digital twin not? Just very briefly, and next slide. Two or three things it's not. Firstly, and I've, I've already said this, it's not just about the visualization. Visualization is important. Visualization is incredibly powerful, but it's not the only piece of the reporting from a digital twin. It's not all virtual. And again, this is a point I've made before. This, this connection to the real world and this constant updating between the physical and the virtual is important here too. Otherwise, it might just be a simulation. And again, that is not useless. That is a very powerful, very capable thing, but it is a simulation, not a digital twin. And I think that the final one of these, what is it not? It's not ever finished. Like painting the fourth bridge in this picture, um, constant process of updating and refining and improving that twin. You're constantly getting new information from the real world to update the model. You're constantly pulling in new data. You're constantly refining and improving models to predict uh, what your next best action should be. Those get better over time. The insights you can offer out to your users get better and richer and more capable over time. So a digital twin will not be finished. It will be it's a living resource and a living um, environment in which you can work and extract value. So just very quickly, uh, I want to look at three broad use cases for the digital twin and jump onto the next slide, please. And the first of these is in the design phase. And this is where we see a lot of interest from, from purveyors of CAD solutions, for example. You know, getting involved in, in building these models of how a physical asset will perform in the real world as the first step in you know, designing it, building it, and then operating it in the real world. And if we jump to the next slide uh, with just one example of this design twin piece, understanding how physical systems will actually work together. Things like collaborative design reviews as the, the construction team and the, the electricians and the fire safety team and the water management team all come together and see how their pieces are actually going to fit together. Seen some really nice examples of this in building nuclear submarines here in the UK uh, just recently, um, where you know, the, the, the team that was running water pipes and the team that was running high voltage power lines weren't actually aware until they saw it virtually that high pressure water and high voltage power lines came a little too close together. And actually it would make sense to move them apart a bit. And in this particular case, we're looking at on the slide here, this is the fire management team for a new building, looking at how um, sprinklers and uh, 
evacuation routes and other pieces of the fire safety um, infrastructure for the building will work together alongside other aspects of that design. Second of these use cases is around the process twin, actually operating this stuff for real. Once you've built it, how do you actually run it? And how do you gather data to optimize that running? One example of this, and this is quite a recent one, this is BMW, the car maker. And they've built a digital twin of um, some of their plants in Germany. And they're using that digital twin to understand how the plant actually works today, but then to optimize it for future use, working out where the robots should go to carry parts, working out whether the work cells in which humans are, are, are building cars are optimized. Um, so looking at you know, how far forward does a worker have to lean? How far do they have to step to move from one task to another? And using the digital model to start tweaking some of those pieces to optimize it. And they're then carrying that through into redesigns of the plant. Really, really interesting, really nice example that they're working on. The third piece, the service twin, actually using all of these data, using all of these insights to deliver value to end customers. This is Schindler, the, the elevator maker, and they're investing heavily in IoT, uh, Internet of Things sensors in their elevators and escalators and other moving um, infrastructure to understand how those assets actually perform in the real world. You know, they know how they should perform. They've tested them in this tower several times. They know what it's meant to work like, but gathering that data from real world operation, real world use to understand how they really perform and then gathering data on individual elevators as well to say, you know, elevator number three in building 27 is vibrating a little bit more than it should. It's probably worth sending a service engineer out to take a look before it breaks. Really interesting example of pulling these, these data flows together. Again, you need all three of these, like the six pieces of a digital twin before, you need all three of these to deliver that value with a digital thread connecting them together. So in theory, at least, the data coming from the service twin, that real world view of how an elevator is performing in your building right now, should feed back to the design twin to improve the design of the next generation of the elevator, in theory. We don't see a lot of it in reality yet, but lots of theory. One of the challenges, the big challenge in digital twin at the moment, is that most of them are still vendor specific. So Schindler builds an elevator and comes with a digital twin for a Schindler elevator. The Otis elevator next to it has a different digital twin. And that's okay for the vendor, for Schindler and Otis, because they are using it to understand their own assets and how they perform. But for you as the building operator, it's entirely unhelpful. You want to understand how your elevators work, whoever they are from. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of interest at the moment in this notion of a complex or composite digital twin that pulls together data from different vendors and different assets to give you a view, a view across the entire building or the entire manufacturing process or the entire jet aircraft. And at the moment, relatively early days on that, but that's where we're seeing a huge amount of investment right now.